and uh, so the healing's coming back, new skin's coming back, Glory. and and I thank the good Lord for that. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> God is a good God all the time, and we're grateful, 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 grateful. Amen. Brother Jim, how are you doing? Praise the Lord. There you go. I like it. How are you, Tim? Pretty good. Pretty and good. Amen. Pretty. Good. Did you know 10 plus 10 makes 20, and 11 plus 11 makes 22? Okay. With that, <laughs> with that, I'll pass the, I'll pass the baton. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we're just so thankful that we can laugh without uh, being disrespectful. We certainly reverence you, God. We certainly fear you. We certainly respect you, mighty God. We know what a wreck we was when you found us, and we're so thankful that we can be in your house tonight and be free as your children to worship you and to serve you and to just be about your business. We stand in awe of your mercy and your patience with us. We're still a work in progress. And I thank you, Father, for this church. And I thank you for the Emmaus community being here tonight to fellowship with us. And we're so thankful that they see fit to have their gatherings here. It's a blessing to us, and we hope a blessing to them. Lord, we pray if there's a need in this house tonight in any capacity. Father, we know you're the, you're the need meter. And we thank you, Lord, for signs and wonders and miraculous deeds being performed by your mercy and by your grace. We thank you for our brother that stands before us tonight in music and in, and in word. We pray that you'd fill his mouth with good things. And, Lord, you just strengthen him and fill him with the Holy Ghost anew and afresh and that he be preached beyond himself and bring the word in simplicity and in accuracy. We thank you for it. May every need be met. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Kim Clout hails from down around Chattanooga, Cleveland area. The Holy City. Holy City. Cleveland? That's what we call it. Is that right? That's our story we're sticking to. Well, <laughs> praise the Lord. He and his lovely wife been in ministry for a long time, do a lot of ministry among the, the Indians, different they tribes. He'll talk life. about that, so I'll let him talk about it. He can do it better than I can. Brother Kim Clout, make him Amen. welcome, please. Hey, hey. What's up, kids? You know, it doesn't matter where I go. I've been coming here, like he said, I bet close to 25 years. How many of you were here 25 years ago? Love it. I talked to a couple people that were already tonight. Um, I'm so thankful for God knitting me together with your pastor and for me having the opportunity to meet each of you. It's such a joy for me to get to come here every January. I look forward to this time. It's kind of like a northern star in my year. I just know I'm going to be in Horse Cave come January. So I'm glad to be here tonight. Uh, I got a good word for you. Everybody do this. Look at the person next to you and say this. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Amen. It's going to be a good one. Aren't you glad to know it's going to be a good one? Okay, let me hear you. Look at whoever you just said that to and look at him and say, just say, tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. It's like that lots of times out in the world. You'll be somewhere, I want the all-you-can-eat shrimp, and they say, oh, that was last night. Is it buy one, get one tonight? That stopped yesterday. Uh, I'd like the all-you-can-eat catfish. I'm sorry, we're out of catfish. How many of you know the world runs out? Yep. The world has limitations to everything that it does. It was last night. It was yesterday. It's only on Thursdays. How many of you know God never runs out? That's why wherever you are, say it. Tonight's the night. Tonight. Say it again with some swag. Y'all, let me hear y'all say, tonight's the night. It is the night. So I'm glad you're here because I'm here and we're going to have a good time. Uh, and how many of you know right about now, People in America need a good time. I mean, we, we see all of the negative things that have been on the news. We saw the, the hurt and anger and all the things that's been going on really for the last six or eight months. So I could be, this is an important time for the people of God to rise up. Amen? 
Because how many know the world is looking for an answer? And i got to be honest with you, I marvel at some of the places they look for an answer. I marvel at some of the people they look to for an answer. When in fact, Jesus is the only one who ever said, I'm the way. Think about it. We have CEOs all over the world tonight trying to hire people. There's no limit to their budget because they want to hire somebody. Find me a way. Make me a way. Well, Jesus said, well, that, that'd be me. He said, I am the way. Let me hear y'all say, that's what he said. He said, I am the way. How many of you know everybody's looking for the truth? How many mothers do I have here tonight? Raise your hand if you're a mom. How many know every mama wants to know the truth? How many here you, your mama can tell when you're lying? Uh-huh. I like how a couple moms right then went. <laughs> your mamas know. Hey, every mama wants the truth. Every wife wants to know the truth. Tell me the truth. Everybody wants to know the truth. How many of you know said, Jesus said, well, th that would be me too. See, I'm not only the way. What else is he? The truth. And how many of you know right now everybody's looking for life? In fact, everybody's just trying to preserve the one they have. Right? I, I, I told you when I was here in October, I've never seen a time when people are so interested in staying alive. And you can tell people they're serious about staying alive because they're washing their hands. Come on now, that's desperation right there, isn't it? <laughs> desperate times, desperate measures. People washing their hands. I don't know about you now, if I'm in the men's room and I see a guy leave, I want to go, hey, y'all, he didn't wash his hands. Because we want to stay alive. And how many of you know Jesus said, well, that, that, that would be me too. So whether you're looking for a way, you're looking for the truth, or you're looking for life, how many know Jesus said, I'm all that? He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He said, no man comes to the Father but through me. In John 10, he said, I'm the only gate to get you into the pen. That's what I ministered on when I was here in October, in fact, I'm reminded. So tonight I thought, that it's important for us to realize Everyone outside of these walls is looking for a way. They're looking for truth. They're looking for life. And because we found that, how many of you know if you found Jesus, you found all that? Amen. Amen. Well, then, I believe it's time for us to rise up. We have something to offer them. And so what I want to do, I want to lay a little foundation before I get to the, the meat of what I'm talking about here. Any, any builders here? Any construction people? So, that, you know, in Bible times, the first stone that they would lay in the foundation, they called it the cornerstone. And they'd have a great ceremony when they put the cornerstone in place. And you, it, you can't have any kind of a strong building if you don't have a good foundation. So I want to lay a little foundation for what I want to minister on tonight. So if you have your Bible in front of you, you can open it. If you don't have it, we're going to put the scriptures up on the screen. But uh, I'm so serious about laying a foundation, I want to go to the book of Genesis. Now... For those of you that are starting to panic, thinking if he's starting in Genesis, how long is he going to preach? <laughs> it ain't going to be that bad, I promise. But we are going to look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Genesis 1, verse 3. Now, the story thus far, in verse 1 and 2, the Bible tells us in verse 1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2 tells us that darkness hovered over the deep and the presence of God was there. But in verse 3... As you see on the screen, something happens here. And I ministered on this one time when I was here before, too. Something happens here that as far as recorded human history is concerned had never happened before. Can anybody tell me what happens in verse 3 that had never happened before? God spoke. God spoke. It says, and God said. How many of you know if somebody says something, they say it out loud? Let me hear you all say. Everybody on this side of it, let me hear you all say. He said it out loud. Let me hear everybody over here say it. He said it out loud. Everybody in the room say it. He said it out loud. What did he say out loud? He said, let there be light. And what was the consequence? There was light. Now, perhaps you've been taught he created light. That's not untrue. For me, it's not the whole truth. Here's the whole truth. God didn't have to create light. He just released it. Say every time. Every time God opens his mouth, Light comes out. Say it again, every time. His mouth is literally the source of all light. When he opened his mouth, light came forth. And remember, he said it out loud, let there be light, and there was light. All right, let's look at verse 6. Genesis 1, verse 6. 
As you look at Genesis 1 verse 6, you're going to notice it starts exactly the same way verse 3 did, which is, and God said. And what did he say? Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters to separate waters from the waters above. In other words, he created the sky. But put your hand to your ear like this. You see, God said, let there be light, and light listened, and it came forth. In verse 6, he said, let there be sky. Put your hand up. And the sky listened, and the sky came forth. Look at verse 9. As you look at verse 9, what do you notice about it compared to verse 3 and 6? It starts the same way. And God said, what did he say? Let the waters under the heavens be collected into one place and let the dry ground appear. So in verse 3, he spoke to light. Put your hand up. Oh, ma'am, you don't have your hand up. You're out of the will of God. Thank you. Uh, we don't want that. You don't want to be out of the will of God. Not right there on the fourth row. That'd be a terrible thing. Put your hand up like that. He spoke to light, and what did light do? It listened. In verse 6, he spoke to the sky. And what did the sky do? And in verse 9, he spoke to the dry ground. And what did the dry ground do? That is why. Everybody look me in the eye. That's why he said it out loud. See, here's the deal. God could, perhaps, have just thought it telepathically and light come forth. But this wasn't a, this wasn't a thought bubble. He literally said this stuff out loud. In verse 3, let there be light. In verse 6, let there be sky. In verse 9, let dry ground appear. Look at verse 14. As you look at verse 14, what do you notice immediately? And God said, it starts the same way that verse 3, 6, and 9 do. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. So in other words, you created the sun so we'd have light by day. You created the moon so we'd have light by night. And it says here, so we could mark days, times, and seasons. Everybody on this side of the room, let me hear you say order. order. Let me hear you all say and purpose. And purpose. Order and purpose. How many of you know God does everything with so even in the beginning, he created order and purpose. It wasn't disarray. I know there's people out there that want you to think everything you see came from a bang. That it was just willy-nilly, bang, and stuff happened. That's a lie. Everything God does, he does with Everything was ordered and purposed, even the lights in the sky, the sun, and the moon. So he spoke in verse 14 to the sun and the moon. Put your hand up there. You knew I'd look, didn't you? And what did the sun and the moon do? They listened. Look at verse 20. Aha, uh-huh, you're on to it. You see the pattern here. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly swarming with living creatures. Here's what I want you to think about. Up till verse 20. The earth, is it the earth, is it 80% water? Yeah, I think it's 80% water. Isn't it interesting that our body is as well? Since we come from the ground, we're the same proportion that the earth is. Let me hear you say, imagine that. So here's what I want you to think about. Up until this verse, you had all the oceans, you had all the rivers, you had all the streams, all the great lakes, all the tributaries, all the little creeks. No life. Totally devoid of life until, verse 20, when God spoke. So you see, God's mouth is not only the source of light, it's the source of all life. Say every time. Every time God opens his mouth, light comes forth. His word is light and his word is life. Say it again, every time. So he spoke in verse 20 to the waters and he said, Let the waters teem with living creatures. Put your hand up. And all the living creatures, from the little minuscule ones to the greatest fish of the sea, they all listened. The birds of the air listened. All the mammals that crawl across the ground, all of the reptiles and amphibians, everything you studied about, all the stuff you've seen on National Geographic and Animal Planet, God spoke it all into existence. And when he spoke, put your hand up. Creation listened. Now look at verse 26. And God said, now, let's talk for a minute. We've looked at verse 3, verse 6, verse 9, verse 14, verse 20, and now verse 26. 
that all began, and God said. Why don't the other verses begin that way? Why is it just those six? Because each of those mark a day of creation. So every time God started a, a day of creation, it starts, and God said. So verse 3 was day 1, verse 6 was day 2, verse 9 was day 3, verse 14, day 4, verse 20, day 5. And now, this is what day? The sixth day. And God said, this is important, let us make mankind in our image. I like that they capitalize us and our. Because in this instance, we're referring to a proper noun, we're referring to God, is the us. God is our Notice he speaks in the plural. Why? Because he is. Everybody in this side of the room, let me hear y'all say, he's a trinity. That's right. Say it with an exclamatory fashion. He's a trinity. Stand up, young lady. I like the way you did that. I want all of you to follow her lead. On three, I want you to say it the way you just said it where they can all see. One, two, three. There you go. Now, if she can do that, all of y'all can do that. Everybody in this section, y'all don't have to stand up. You can sit down, sweetheart. Give her a hand, didn't she do good? Everybody on this side, let me hear y'all. He's the Trinity. Very good. Now, all of you on this side of the room, well, settle down. Uh, I, I pre I'm going to give you high marks for enthusiasm, but I want to refine that enthusiasm. See, here's the deal. I want everybody on this side of the room to use your deductive reasoning. Now, guys, what does that mean? I want you to draw on your inner Sherlock. Is this your husband, ma'am? You seem noncommittal, is it? Yes, okay, all right. <laughs> she, he, by the way, he never moved. Stone-faced, never moved. I, and he took the guy approach. You can tell he's a married man because he knew don't make eye contact at a time like this. <laughs> Just look straight ahead and seem totally innocent. Okay. So let me ask you, ma'am, how long have y'all been married? Eight years, okay. So you, you should have him trained by now, don't you? You'd think so. Okay, all right. Well, what I wanted to ask you is, what's his name? Colby. Does Colby have an inner Sherlock? Okay, look at him right now and say, use it, baby. There you go. So all of you guys here, let's follow Colby's lead. Use your inner Sherlock. Ladies, you just do what you naturally do. Be discerning. So, your line is What? Stand up and show them again. They've already forgot. On three, one, one, two, three. There you go. Okay. So your line is. Now, those of you on this side of the room, if. What do we know about ourselves? Amen. And how do we know we're a trinity? We're made in his image. We're made in his likeness. But here's what I want to draw your attention to. It says, and God said, let us. Make mankind in our image after our likeness. So, he's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're spirit, soul, and body, right? Yes. Say it. He's a trinity. He's a trinity. I'm, a trinity. I'm a trinity. But it's deeper than that. If that's all there was, you'd see a period after the word likeness. But what do you see? What, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What sign of punctuation do you see after the word likeness? A comma. A comma. Anybody here pay attention when we were diagramming sentences and language arts. You did, ma'am? Okay, could you tell us what is a comma indicate? Well, that's impressive. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Let me hear y'all say that's impressive. It is impressive. It separates one thought from another thought, although they're likened to it. And, and, and for me, as you read this, and this is the beauty of punctuation. Punctuation not only tells you what was said, it tells you how it was said. So in other words, God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. Pause. Uh, every woman, in, all the married women in here, raise your hands. Every married woman in this room knows when you want to tell him something, you say certain things and then you stop. And you just look at him. Because you understand in that pause, and, and how many of you girls have pe perfected the look? Yeah, you all have. 
So you say it and then you look. Because you know, in that pause is when he's going, jigga, 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 and he's getting it. <laughs> so it was with God. Uh, stay with me here. And God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. Pause. And this translation is the, uh, is this amplified? I prefer the NIV because in the, amp in the amplified, they don't have the two words that come next, which I love. It says, and let them. The way the NIV reads is, so that. Everybody say, so that. See, so so here's the deal. You're created in the image of God, and it's more than just he's a trinity, you're a trinity. You're created in his image so that. So that. Those may be two of the most important words in the scripture. So that. So that what? So that we may what? Have complete authority. The NIV says so that we could rule. So that we could have complete authority over what? The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, everything he made. See, so here's the deal. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. For 25 verses, from Genesis 1-1 to 125, God spoke, put your hand up, and all creation listened to him. But as of verse 26, God tagged us in. He gave us the authority to speak to creation. It isn't our authority, it's his authority, but he tagged us in. Look at your neighbor and say, he tagged me in. He did. Now let me ask you, those of you that are enterprising, those of you that are deep in the things of God, who can tell me how is authority, since we're talking about authority here, he gave us his authority, how is authority exercised and released? Through the mouth. Look at me. That's why he had to say each day of creation out loud. When he spoke it out loud, he released his authority. I'm going to say it again. Authority is exercised and released through the mouth. In fact, I'm going to ask you, church, how is authority exercised and released? <laughs> through the mouth. Now, in verse 26, he gives us that authority. And I won't take time to show you the verse, but I bet you know, immediately after this, he marched every animal he created by Adam. And what do you have Adam do? Name them. Hmm. Why didn't God name them? Was he just slapped, worn out from all that creating? I'm telling you, Adam, six days of creating has just took it out of me. I'm, I'm just about beat. i got to take a knee here. No. I'll suggest to you he couldn't name them because he gave that authority to Adam. And remind me, church, how is authority exercise or release? So that's why he marched every bit of creation right by Adam, and then Adam named him. How many of you know that proves you have authority over something when you name it? Come on, y'all. Let me y'all say, that's good. <laughs> say it like Andy Griffith, y'all. Let me y'all say, that's good. <laughs> it is good. So God gave us dominion over all of creation. Put your hand up. So that from verse 26 of Genesis 1 to today, all of creation is listening to you. Check this out. Every time you speak, any time you speak, now you know why the Bible says in Proverbs, in your tongue is the power of what? Now you know why Jesus could say in Mark 11, speak to the mountain. Why did he tell you to go around it? Why didn't he tell you to climb it? Why didn't he tell you to speak to it? Put your hand up. Because it's listening. It's listening. See, that's why Jesus said, if you had faith, if you had the God kind of faith, which you do, the Bible says he gave unto every man the measure of faith. Amen? He said, I got the God kind of faith. So what he was doing was kind of rattle your cage and say, hey, quit trying to go around your mountain. Just to be sure of the demographic I'm dealing with tonight. How many of you here have a mountain in your life? Come on, don't lie about it and make it worse. How many of you here have a mountain in your life? We all do. Some of us have a range of them. And many of you perhaps have spent your life trying to go around them. Many people do anything to avoid conflict. Do anything to avoid hardship. But here's the deal. You keep running, which is essentially what you're doing if you're going around your mountain, you'll never get victory over it. 
you'll feel like a defeat. But you're not a, vi a victim and you're not defeated. You simply haven't been doing what God told you to do. Others of you may be saying, you tell them, preacher. I don't go around anything I could climb. Well, did God tell you to climb the mountain? I remember growing up, we used to sing a song, God, don't move that mountain, give me the strength to climb it. I remember asking lots of times, is that in the Bible? No. But we sang it like it was. God never told you to climb your mountain. And see, that's what many of you tried to do. You're a type A personality. How many of you here are the people that when the light turns green, if the people in front of you don't go, you're honking your horn? It's green! Y'all the ones that like to climb your mountain. You spend a lifetime trying to climb your mountain and all your jeans have got holes in the knees. Not because you're fashionable, but because you keep falling down. You got that flag you want to put in the top if you ever make it, but you hadn't made it yet. But you know what? You could feel like a failure, but you're not. It's simply that you're doing something God never told you to do. That's a word for somebody here. God didn't tell you to climb your mountain. What did he tell you to do? Why? Put your hand up. Yes, it is. Thank you, Pastor. Is that in the Bible? Yeah. How about this? How about when the lady came to Jesus and she had a fever? What did he speak to? The fever. Put your hand up. And it listened. Come on, y'all. See me all saying, creation, listen. How many of the Bible says that if you don't cry out, the rocks will? The Bible says if you don't clap your hand, the trees of the field will. Come on, y'all. Of course creation listens. That in the Bible. Let me prove to you it is. Look at Romans 8, 19. Boy, don't y'all love Dale up there. Everybody turn around and look at Dale. He's the one sitting up there on the left side. Look at him and tell him, say, you're one of them good ones. You're one of them good ones, Dale. I don't know if you've noticed, every scripture I call for, as soon as I say it, boom, there it is. That ought to be a song, shouldn't it? Anyhow, <laughs> he says, for the whole of creation, all of nature is what? Waiting. How many of you here have ever waited for something? It says it's waiting expectantly. Ladies, again, I want to speak to the married women for a minute. How many of you married women, when you want him to know you're tired of waiting, You've mastered what I call the sigh. Come on, girls. Don't sit there and look at me like, what? You know what? When you've had to wait too long, when he's fiddling around, when he's watching something on TV you don't want to watch, when he's watching a football game when you'd like him to come watch a movie with you or whatever, on three, I want all of you girls to give me that sigh. One, two, three. There's probably a cousin of hubs in here that jumped just when they heard that sigh. It's just reflexive. They can't help it. In fact, immediately it came out before he could help himself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. See, women have mastered the art of nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication. Uh, they're excellent. It's genetic, brother, I'm telling you. Uh, you know, here's my experience with my wife. The only time she leaves me confused is when she intends for me to be. <laughs> Otherwise, what she wants or needs is made abundantly clear. And sometimes she does it just through the sigh. <laughs> and you know, that sigh could mean anything from I'm tired of waiting to my father was right about you. It could be that whole range. <laughs> You'll think next time you hear her do that sigh. <laughs> Creation tells us here that it's tired of waiting because it says it's waiting expectantly and it's longing earnestly for what? For God's sons to be made known, to be revealed. Now, I didn't have Dale put the verse up, 
But if you look about verse 22 or 23, it says it's been waiting so long that now it started groaning like a woman giving birth. In other words, that's not just a... Uh, I mean, I've never been in a room, didn't want to be in a room when anybody's giving birth. But that's, to me, that's the most incredible thing that happens in the natural realm. is the birth of a child. A birth of a child that a mother can bring forth life like that. But it's a great travail, pain, agony. The Bible tells us that that is the way creation is right now. It's not just waiting earnestly. But here it tells us it's moaning. Thank you, Dale. Very impressive. Everybody look up there at him again and say, very impressive, Dale. It tells us that it's not only waiting, but it's waiting like pains of childbirth. And you, you read it for us there, Pastor, and drew attention to it. It's waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So, I have a question for you. Who are the sons of God? Let me y'all say, that'd be me. When I ask who are the sons of God, I want all of you to wave like this. Who are the sons of God? Come on, do it like your goofy cousin would, you know. That real dorky wave. Right, excellent. So, we, how many of you agree we are the sons of God? Okay, then I got a question for you. Many of you have read your Bible three and four times through. That means you've read this verse. So I don't want you to answer out loud, but I just want you to think, what did you think when you read this verse? When you read that creation is waiting for us, now we know who we are. I said, who are the sons of God? And all of you said, oh, that'd be me. So if we know who we are, what is creation missing? Well, the scripture said, go back to verse 19, if you would, brother. It says it's waiting for us to be revealed. So how do we reveal ourselves to creation? Do we blow a trumpet and go, ta-da! Do we tweet it out? Do we do it on Facebook? Instagram? Parlor? As far as I know, y'all. I'm not on any of them, but that's all I know. Do we just take a cell phone and shoot a selfie? I'm serious. Wouldn't you think that by now, creation could have said, oh, oh that, there they are. But the Bible tells us it's waiting for the sons of God to be real. Now, we've already agreed we are the sons of God, right? So what have we not yet done the creation's waiting for. And that's what I believe the people in America are waiting for. They're waiting for the same thing creation is. And I believe we have our answer from Jesus. Remember, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? So he's going to show you the way. How many of you know everything Jesus did in his life is what we're supposed to be doing? If you ever wonder, how should I do this? Well, that's why that big thing of what would Jesus do came in. Is we're, we're called by his name. We're to be as he is, right? We're to think like he thinks, act like he acted, talk like he talked, right? How many of you know if you think like the world thinks, if you act like the women on The View, if you talk like the women on The View, if you listen to MSNBC, CNN, NBC, CBS, ABC, and any of that other alphabet soup, how many of you know if you act and talk like they do, then you'll get what they get? But you and I have been called to be a separate people. Come on, y'all. So what is it the world is looking for that it hadn't found yet? I mean, America is 244 years old. Wouldn't you think by now we'd have had a president, a leader, a mayor, a governor, a civic leader, a civil rights leader? Wouldn't somebody have come to the forefront to say, here's the way? But we're more confused than we've ever been today. Hey, we don't even know the difference in a man and a woman. Am I telling the truth? How many know in 1776, when America was founded, everybody wanted to come to America because America was a place where a man could be a man? 2020, America is a place where a man could be a woman. Wouldn't y'all think we'd have wrestled to the ground by now the difference in a man and a woman? I got to be honest with you. I remember when I was a little kid, the first time I discovered there's a difference. 
And y'all remember that day for you too. Come on now. Quit being church people and just be honest. That was an epiphany, wasn't it? I mean, I was like, Shazam. I'm talking to you married men tonight. Colby, aren't you glad she don't look like you? Y'all know what Colby's thinking right now. I can tell you. I can read that man's mind. He's thinking, why did we sit on the second row? What were we thinking? He's going to tell her as soon as we get in the car, I will never sit up there. At least when that crazy man's there, I am never going to sit up here. And by the way, he tried with me what he does with her. He said, just don't make eye contact. Just don't look. If I can't see him, he can't see me. Just, he's thinking right now, it's the most attractive carpet I've ever seen. They have in this beautiful carpet. Beautiful. So here's the deal. If the world had it going on, they'd have it going on. But, I mean, clearly they don't. How I many you know we got everybody in this ditch telling everybody in that ditch you're doing it wrong? Yeah. Calling them names. Yeah. And how I many you know about every 10 years they all switch ditches? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So no wonder creation and the world is waiting for the children of God to be revealed. So how are we revealed? Jesus spoke to that too. Matthew 28, verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. This is Jesus speaking. He's speaking to the disciples just before he ascends into heaven. And he says to them in what is called the Great Commission. He says, I want you to go and make what? Does it say church members? Why doesn't it? Because how many of you know on Judgment Day, being a church member ain't going to matter? Let's be honest. Some people are Baptists. The same way other people are Methodists and other people are interdenominational, the same way some people are Chevy people and some people are Ford people. Being a church member ain't going to get you to heaven. But I've got a Bible with my name in gold on the cover. Good, won't get you to heaven. It's in cursive. Doesn't matter. Because church members aren't what he called us to make. He said, go make disciples. What is a disciple? That's a lifelong follower of Jesus. Somebody acts like he ta acts, talk like he talks, thinks like he talks, and not only that, gets what he got. Amen? Everybody in this side of the room, let me hear y'all say, same anointing? Let me hear y'all say, same results. That in the Bible is exactly what he said. He said, what I've done, you'll do greater than. Let me hear y'all say, that's what he said. Say it again over here. Same anointing? Same results. Amen. So, he says, go make disciples of all men everywhere. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you got several men who are sitting here watching Jesus say this. Mark saw the exact same thing. How many of you know if you've got two, three people see the same thing? They, by and large, will tell you the same. Certain ones will notice other details that the other one didn't. So, let's look at Mark 16, 15. And this Mark recounting of the Great Commission. He said, and he said to them... Go into all the world and preach and publish openly the good news to every what? Huh. How I many you know that isn't limited to just humanity? How I many of you know all the creation is listening? And it's waiting for us to be revealed. So how are we revealed? I won't in fact, bring up the next three verses, brother. I didn't tell you to, Dale, but you can do anything, I perceive. He says, and those who believes and trusts and relies on the gospel in whom and with whom it is set forth and is baptized will be saved, and those who do not will be condemned. But look at the next verse. Look at verse 17. He gives you a way that you can tell. He says, and those who are attesting will have signs that what? Accompany or follow. He says they'll have signs following them. And then we have a semicolon. Madam? Uh, it explains the previous clause that was made. Fist bump me there. Virtual. There we go. Okay. So, and these signs will follow those who believe. Here's how you'll know. Number one, in my name, they'll what? 
I've been in ministry 42 years. There have been times I literally have seen people who are demon-possessed. That had to have that demon spoke to and be set free. Many of you perhaps have never seen anybody with a demon. Here's my suggestion. Go out here on I-65 or I-24 and wait around a little while and you'll see one. <laughs> As I drove through Nashville today and I guarantee there's a bunch of them there that are demon-possessed. He said they will also speak in new languages or speak in tongues. Right? Look at the next part of the verse. He says they'll pick up servants, and even if they drink anything deadly, it won't hurt them. And then what will they do if they see somebody sick? They'll lay hands on them. And what happens if they lay hands on them? Right. So here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus said for three and a half years, everybody look at me. Jesus said for three and a half years, let me show you how a child of God is revealed. The Bible says everywhere he went, say everywhere. Everywhere he went, he went about doing good. I remember when I bought my first weed eater. My wife said, Kim, you're just like Jesus. I said, what do you mean? She said, everywhere you went with that thing, you went about doing good. <laughs> everywhere Jesus went, he did something good. How many of you know if he encountered somebody that was lame, what did he do? And they walked. If he encountered somebody deaf, what? They could hear. If he encountered somebody that was mute, they could speak. And check this out. If he encountered somebody dead, what happened? So Jesus said, here's how a child of God is revealed. He took three and a half years. He showed the 12 who were closest to him. Here's how it's done. It so happens that many multitudes were able to watch as well to see. Here's how a child of God is revealed. And then, say the last thing. The last thing he said to the disciples was, y'all remember what I did? I laid hands on the sick and they recovered. I cast out demons. Remember when I did that stuff? I call it the Holy Ghost stuff. Let me all say Holy Ghost stuff. Here's what he said to the disciples. He said, I want y'all to be Holy Ghost stuff doers. How about over here? Let me hear y'all say, I'm a Holy Ghost stuff doer. Let me hear y'all say it. Let me hear everybody say, I do that Holy Ghost stuff. That's right. That's what sets this church aside from many in this county. All of them got buildings, all of them got pulpits, all of them got pews, but there are a bunch of them don't have no Holy Ghost stuff. But Jesus said, here's the deal. If you are following me, if you're a lifelong follower of me, if you're a disciple like I am, you'll do what I did. And you'll get what I got. Let me all say, that's what he said. So here I have for you seven words. Say seven words. I'm going to share with you seven words. Dale, can we do this? Or seven? Show off. <laughs> Everybody look at him right now and say, Dale, you're a show off. Yeah. He is. Show he is. Off. See, here's the deal. You see up there the word information. How many know this is the information age? Agreed? I mean, we got more information than we've ever had. The average smartphone, I was reading an article the other day. Smartphone. The average smartphone that every American, I'm talking about 12-year-old kids are holding one, has more computer power in it than all the computers that took the first NASA space mission to the moon and back. In the palm of your hand. Let me hear you all say, Shazam. <laughs> this is information age. Huh? How many know you don't need an encyclopedia? How many of y'all remember? Where's the world book? How many of y'all remember going and getting a world book off the shelf? You got to go home and do a theme on dogs. You go get the D. Where's the D for the world book? Because if you didn't have that, you didn't know, did you? What do you do today? You could have somebody ask you, when did Tom Petty die? They can tell you. Where was he born? They can tell you. How did he die? There it is. Who did Muhammad Ali fight for the third time when he won the championship for the third time? There it is. What year did the Braves actually win the World Series? That I know, 95. <laughs> this is the information age. You can know anything right now. Right? So, if you're not careful, the 66 books that comprise the Bible could be nothing more than information. 
It could be struggling and competing with all the other information for your attention. So what do we have to do to take the Bible to transform it from simple information? Well, it's simple. We need to add to our information meditation. Meditation. And there he is. Meditation. How many of you know the Lord told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, meditate on my word when? Day and night. Why? Because how many of you have learned you can read the word? I've been in ministry 42 years. There's still stuff I read in the Bible that I go, what? I'm serious. There's a lot of it that's just hard for me to wrap my head around. And when I get to that point, you know what I do? I close it. And then I begin to meditate on what I just read. Why? Because that's the way you get the depth of God's Word. How many of you know you don't read it once and you got it? You read your Bible, oh yeah, I read it in 84. I really enjoyed it. I may read it again sometime. I'm reading John Grisham right now. You don't read the Bible once and you got it. I'm certain your pastor's read it a thousand times. And he'll tell you there's still stuff there that's difficult to grasp, isn't it? So what do we do with this information? You meditate on it. Say, I take information from the Word of God and I add to it meditation. Wonder what you'd get if you meditated on the Word of God. I'm thinking you would get, Dale, revelation. Wave your hand and say, I know that's right. I mean, you talk to the great Bible teachers of the day. They didn't find that wisdom laying in the parking lot. They weren't walking out of their hotel and went, Oh, look, the wisdom of God. You don't accidentally find the wisdom of God. You know how you get the wisdom of God? You look for it. The Lord said, I'm not going to look for you. You're going to have to look for me. But he said, Of all those who diligently seek me, I'll reward them. He says, If you look for me, I will be found. So if you meditate on that information, what will you get? You'll get the revealed truth of God's Word. Do you stop there? No. Once you've got revelation, you know what that will give you? Come on, Dale. An inspiration. You ever wondered, what were you thinking when you got up and walked over there and laid hands on that woman? Did you even know her? No. But I felt a, 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 inside of me an inspiration that I was going to go do it. I'm sure you've done that many times. Many times you just know in your spirit, I need to go pray for that person. There have been times when I'm preaching, I look five, six hundred people, and I know when I'm ministering, I see somebody out there, the Lord will show me people that aren't born again. The Lord will show me people, this word is for them. And when I ask, is there anybody here that doesn't know Jesus already? I'm looking right at them because I'm waiting. Their head's bowed. I can see if they parted their hair straight, but I know if they don't know Jesus. Where does that come from? It's the Holy Ghost giving you inspiration. How does inspiration come? It isn't cheap. There's a cost to be paid if you want to know the deep things of God. You don't just find it laying around. You look for it. You try to find it. So you take information and you meditate on it, and what do you get? And once you've got a revelation, what is that likely to bring? And once you've got an inspiration, what could happen? Dale, how about a demonstration? Wouldn't that be something? A demonstration. That is what creation is looking for. Amen. A demonstration of the, child, the children of God. Somebody that's got signs and wonders following them instead of somebody following signs and wonders. For too long we've had church people that follow signs and wonders. Did you hear about that meeting that's happening in Toronto? Did you hear what's happening in Tampa? Did you hear what was happening in Pensacola? I'm not knocking any of those things. Those were all great moves of God. I'm simply saying, frequently the church is doing exactly the opposite of what Jesus taught. We're following signs and wonders when he said they should be following us. Say it again. I'm a Holy Ghost stuff doer. Say everywhere I go, I do that Holy Ghost stuff. Now, if we had the information of the Word of God and we gave that some meditation, what would we get? And once we had a revelation, what would that bring forth? And if we had an inspiration, what are we likely to give? And if we got a demonstration, wonder what would happen then. 
a manifestation. Somebody that couldn't hear can hear. Prayed for a man one night. He came forth. He said, I've got a problem with my feet. Didn't tell me what it was. Got a problem with my feet. His wife came up there with him. I could tell what you want the Lord to do for you. Because I don't know. The Lord hadn't revealed to me. I said, what do you want the Lord to do for you? He said, i got a problem with my feet. And I said, is, is that it? Or is there much? He said, no, that's it. And his wife said, he doesn't like to talk about it. I said, that's fine. He don't have to. I said, God knows. I don't need to know. And so we prayed for him. Couldn't tell anything. Didn't know what we were praying for exactly with his feet. But he got up there, and we prayed for him. There were several that came around, and we laid hands on him. He went back in his seat and sat down, and the service was over. And I didn't know until the next morning the pastor called me and said, you need to know about that man that came forth with his feet the other night. He said, the problem was one of them shorter than the other. Been shorter than the other one from the time he was born. He's so self-conscious about that, I'm using the word never, never take his shoes off, even around his wife. So embarrassed of his feet was he. That night, say that night. Remember, tonight's the night, y'all. Say it, tonight's the night. I mean, God is always in the right now. He's the great I am. Tonight is always the night in the power of God. He said, his wife said, first time I've seen his feet. And the first time I saw his feet, they're the same length. God healed his feet, y'all. We got a manifestation. What do you reckon happened after that manifestation for that man and his wife? Bring it forth, Bella. A celebration. Come on, y'all. How many of you know once you see the power of God moving, it manifests somehow? Somebody's going to shout glory to God. Let me hear y'all shout right now. Raise your hands. Everybody in the room, put your hands up. Come on, y'all do better than that. I've seen people in Kentucky when their basketball teams play. And they lose their mind. Well, no, that's true. But whether it's the Cardinals or UK, I've seen how crazy you Kentucky people are about basketball. I don't have a problem with that. Here's the deal. How I many you know Jesus has done stuff that Coach Rupp could never do? Huh? That Denny Crum could never do? Come on, y'all. I'm going to give you another run at it. On three, I want everybody in the room to raise both hands, and I want you to shout a victory shout, a celebration shout. Celebrate the fact of what God's going to do for you in 2021. The 20 and 21 is going to be the greatest year you've had, the most prosperous, the healthiest, the most productive year you've ever had on three. One, two, three. Yes! Glory to God. Glory. Church. All of creation is waiting for the children of God to be revealed. What are we supposed to do? Right there. Start with information. The Word of God. Meditate on it, and you'll get a revelation. Once you've got a revelation, it's likely to bring an inspiration. Don't act till it does. When you get an inspiration, guess what? You'll give a demonstration, and then you're probably going to get a manifestation. And I guarantee when you get a manifestation, you're going to have a celebration. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it was a good one. Isn't it terrible when people brag on themselves? I'm sorry. <laughs> Bow your heads, close your eyes. It don't matter where I go or what I minister on or what I teach on. I try to never stop without giving opportunity for somebody to get born again. Because I never assume just because people in church that they know Jesus. Because I know how long I went to church when I didn't know Jesus. I said it earlier, going to church ain't going to get you to heaven. Owning a Bible won't get you to heaven. Just because your wife's a Christian won't make you one. Jesus said, you must be born again. Told a man named Nicodemus, you must be born again. How does that happen? Well, it's not complicated. Here's the good news. You won't need a password. No forms to fill out, no lines to stand in. The Apostle Paul broke it down like this. He said, all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and then confess that with your mouth and you'll be born again. So if you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, been to church, but you've never stopped your whole life and just said, hold on, I've got to admit, I'm a sinner. I've got to admit my life is broken and I don't know how to fix it. Lord, I want to give you, I surrender all. You sing an old song when I was a kid. I surrender all. 
Unto you, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. What does he want from you? Your heart. Because if he's got your heart, he's got it all. So if you've never given your heart to Jesus, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you stand up or come to the front. Everybody's got their head bowed and their eyes closed. I'm the only one looking. But I will pray with you right where you're seated. If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, but you're ready. If you've been looking for a way. If you've been looking for truth. If you've been looking for life. I used to look for the truth and the life in so many places that the world told me it was. And it was a lie. I found bondage instead of freedom. I found heartbreak instead of hope. I did everything the world was telling me to do, and I was miserable. I tried everything the world has, many of you perhaps as well. Tonight, try Jesus. If you've never tried Jesus, if you've never asked him in your heart, give him a chance. Let him show you what he can do with your life. He'll start with your heart. He'll change it. If you're here tonight and you're ready to make that decision, I want you to do something simple. Right where you're seated. Just raise your hand. I want to see it. Just high enough where I can see it. I just want to pray for you. Just high enough where I can see it. I see it. You can put it down. I see it. You can put it down. That's two. Church pray. God's moving. I believe there may be somebody else here. I never rush. This is eternity at stake for somebody here. I used to think I'll get saved when I'm 40. I'll get saved when I'm 50. Four of my closest friends never made it to 18. That's when it got my attention. I'd been partying with them up to an hour before they were all killed. In many ways, I knew that probably should have been me instead of them. And that's when I realized I don't have a promise of 30 or 40. I don't even have a promise of 18. You've already had two people raise your hands, but if you've not raised your hands, but you know the Spirit of God's knocking on your heart tonight. You're not sure how you're going to do this, but you're willing to give God a chance for your life. If that's you and you hadn't already raised your hands like these two, if there's somebody else, just raise it where I can see it. Do it right now. Do it right now. If the Spirit of God's moving on your heart, obey God. Do it right now. The Bible tells us when just one person says yes, every angel in heaven rejoices. Tonight we got two adults, guys. So here's what I want us to do. Everybody keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want everybody in the room to show these two how highly we esteem them and how much we love them. I want you all to pray this prayer out loud with them right now. Father, I thank you for loving me. So much that you sent your son to die. That I might live. That by his shed blood, my sins are forgiven, my body is healed, and my heart is renewed. And by his resurrection, I now have eternal life. I have a future because I'm delivered from my past. And I'll never look back in Jesus' name. Church, can we give God glory for these two folks tonight? Come on. Come on. I live for that. Here's the deal. I'm a man of my word. I didn't have you come to the front. I still will not. Pastor Phillips sitting right here on the second row. Most important thing you can do when you get born again is tell somebody. Because here's the deal. If you can't tell that man, you won't be able to tell anybody. Because you'll never meet anybody more happy to hear you than that man right there. So before you leave, I saw you raise your hand, so don't make me come back there. If you've never heard me, you should have already figured out. He'll do it. I will. I want you to tell Pastor Philip, brother, before we uh, turn this service over to you, I just want to play a song for everybody before we go home. Les, come up here. Good. Maybe these two tonight will want to be baptized. That would be wonderful. Glory to God. Come on up here, brethren. You know, I can remember... My parents did gospel music all over the world. My dad played in 115 countries. I grew up in a musical family. They're in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. Every night of my life, I heard gospel music. When I was 13, I started playing myself, making money, made a living playing music. I knew from the time I was a little boy, I want to do that. I remember the first time I saw somebody hold an electric guitar, I'm going to do that. I wanted to do it. 
I had a desire to do it. And later, the Lord kind of revealed to me, I put a gift in you to do it. So how many of you know a gifting, an anointing, an ability that God gives doesn't mean anything unless you know the source of that gift? There have been tremendous musicians. Eddie Van Halen, a guitar player for the generations, who was clearly anointed to play. But if you don't know the source of your anointing, the gift dies with you. And so my heart was always, I want to play music and I want to do it under the glory of the Lord. It's kind of funny. If, if you will, brother, I'm going to switch to this other mic. I'm going to cut this handheld off and go to my one on the stand. So the first time I, I saw somebody play, I knew I want to do that. And I wanted to play in church. And I'll never forget the first time I went to church with my guitar. As soon as I walked in, they said, it's too loud. And I said, I haven't plugged it in yet. And I kind of discovered that uh, pleasing church people is a moving target. You know, I tried in them early days to, to please church people. And you know what I found? I couldn't. I mean, I tried. I wanted to. I wanted to please them. And I couldn't. And I got so heartbroken. And I, I'm telling you the truth. I, I'm funny a lot of times, but, but I'm serious. My heart was broken. I thought, Lord, I, I want to do this to your glory. I want to, I want to bless them. And, and they don't like it. And I can't please them. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, I can't either. He said, why are you even trying? He said, in fact, I never told you to play to them. He said, I told you to play unto me. Boy, that freed me up. Because I realized if I can take the gift he gave me and I can play unto him, I want you to like it. But don't misunderstand. I don't care if you do. Because I'm doing it as unto him. But uh, I, I love to, to play. This first song I'm going to do for you is called Nobody. And y'all are going to help. It's Shake and Bake. How many of y'all remember that commercial? And then what did the little girl say? And I helped. That's right. Y'all are going to help. Let me hear y'all say, we're going to help. You know, in that case, the word help has two syllables. Say it. We're going to help. All right, you are. Guys, just hold on. This is your part. Let me hear y'all say, nobody. I want you to growl it. All right? I want you to go, nobody. All right? I actually want you to do it twice. I want you to go, nobody, nobody. Here we go. Wait till I show you. I give my life, Lord, to nobody but you. Say it. Again. All right, good. Les, uh, the Spirit of God just spoke to me and said you should turn these monitors up a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Y'all wave up here at Les. Say, go head on, Les. Now, most of his life, he's yearned to hear these words, and I'm going to let you speak them to him. Say, Les, turn your bass up. <laughs> All right, remember, what's your part? Nobody, nobody. All right, guys, you ready? 12 bars of guitar right from the start. One, two, three.
Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. For you that ain't never been in a Holy Ghost church, welcome. <laughs> Amen. You know, there's people all around the country that's got a talent, that's got a gift, that's got an ability, that a stiff-necked church has made them take their gift and go somewhere else. And serve some other God. And that's sad. I know it don't suit everybody. And I, I hate that for you. But I believe every praise belongs to our God. Every praise belongs to Jesus Christ. Every gift. Every talent. Every ability. Should be unto his glory. And his honor. And his praise. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. We should not waste our gifts and talents and abilities on other things when he and he alone deserves the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. So we, we need to make room. I know we can't do everything in the church, and we can't please everybody, but if we just try to please God, wouldn't that be good? Amen. So praise the Lord. Tonight we celebrate as a community and as a church and as individuals the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate his crucifixion. We celebrate his being beaten and battered and bruised. We celebrate all of our iniquities, all of our sins, all of our transgressions being laid upon him. And we celebrate the victory that he brought us through his body, the death of his body, and through the shedding of his blood. As a community, we do this every time we come together. And every weekend when we have our walks, it's multiple times. Multiple times. And it's one of the times that we come together and it makes no difference from what branch of God's tree. Did you hear me? What branch of God's tree you're hanging on. Whether it's a Democrat branch or, or, or whatever it is, the branch, you're tied to the tree. And we forget all of that and come together as one body because we are saved by one blood, the covenant that God made with us through his son. So tonight, I've asked people to come. And uh, I know we got all of our social distance and we got our, we got to be careful. So I didn't bring a loaf of bread for us to pull off of. And I certainly didn't bring a loaf of bread for us to tear and to confess our sins on, put it in a basket and somebody else eat it. Right? But I did bring a loaf of bread that's broke up in pieces. And I did bring juice and in individual cups. And I've asked these men to put on masks and gloves and to hand you a piece of bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ and to hand you a cup of juice so you could celebrate and we could celebrate together. Is that all right? So I'm going to ask you to do two things in one, one application. I'm going to get this young man right here to help me. And we're going to stand on either side with a collection plate. And if you want to give the man of God that ministered in song and in word tonight an offering, then we give you the opportunity to do that. This night we're not taking up an offering for the community. We're giving this offering to him. This is what he does for his entire living for his life and he goes all over the world taking this gospel message and this is his source of income to do that so what I'm saying by that he's a good place to plant a seed very good so I'd ask you to help me would you please 